the way that most applications will send that, and most people look at it and think it's encryption, but it's not, is they'll actually take that stream, that password stream like that, and it'll simply, the application will simply encode it as base64. And then this is what you see in the request. Guess what? That is just as bad as that. Because we can simply take that string, put it in a decoder like BERT, or even just go to Google and say base64 decode. We can take that string and decode it as base64, and now we know what the clear text is. We can modify something in there to be whatever we want, and then re-encode it as base64, and then inject it that way, because that's what it's looking for. So when you see this in your post requests and stuff, this is not encryption, guys. This is just basic for encoding, which can easily be undone by doing something like what I just showed here. So, but mind you, for the simplicity of this attack, I'm going to leave it clear so you can see everything that I'm doing. So basically for clear doesn't matter. The effect is the same. I'm going to copy that entire URL. All right. Because what's going to happen is I'm going to now, in a script attack, plant this in the script. Now, currently, the password here is already Moon. So if I log in as admin, you know, if I use a password of Moon instead of admin, it logs me in. So it's already changed to Moon. So now we've established that. Now we're going to go back to attacker victim mode. So now we're pretending this is done. Her current password is moving. We're now going to go to a completely different site somewhere else in the world on the internet. And on this site, we're going to plan a cross site script attack. So this is where people get confused with it. Generally, for cross-site request forgery, one of the primary um, ways that it's exploited is through hook cross-site scripting attack. So that's why a lot of times people get them confused. So what I'm going to do is, again, just do like a hello. And in there, I'm going to do an IMG source. But instead of pointing to the image, I'm going to put this. I'm going to do that. All right, and instead of moon, I'm going to make it cat. So the logic is now, media attacker, I'm going to save this to this blog or this entry. And then now Donna is going to come. Now we're switching to Donna. Donna, while she has her Chase account open, she comes over and now she decides to visit the site and she wants to look at that blog. So she goes and views all the blogs. Including mine that I just posted here. So she's looked at it. Well, guess what? From looking at that blog entry, she just ran my script in her browser. Okay. So if we now go over and Donna logs out and tries to log in with admin and admin doesn't work. Admin and move just to show you um, that that's what I'm putting in. Admin and Moon doesn't work, but guess what works? Admin and cat. Absolutely works. So now Dr. just by visiting my blog or visiting somebody's blog post, she just inadvertently had her password on her Chase account changed from moon to cat. And she has no clue that that just happened. Now, as a result of that, here's the thing. There's a few things that have to be perfect for cross-site request forwarders to work. Number one, the, the web browser that Dot is using has to be vulnerable to scripting. Like, so she has to be allowing scripts to run whatever the case may be. Number two, Chase has to be vulnerable in two ways. One, 
they're using predictable tokens like this. You know, when you do something like change your password, um, okay, this is the definition of, this is not a, a predict, a non-predictable token. This is very predictable. Even if it's base 64 encoded, it's still predictable. So Chase has to be doing that, something like that. And Chase has to be allowing her to change her password without entering the old password or re-authenticating. So that's criteria that has to exist for this exact attack to work that way. But conceptually, you see how cross-site request forgeries work now, and you see what the danger is. So the, the one difference is with cross-site request forgeries, if you notice, we now violated the trust that the application has for the browser. The Chase web application just blindly trusted that because Donna's authenticated session said change password, that it really is Donna asking to change the password, so it allowed it. But with the cross-site scripting that we looked at before, what ended up happening there was the browser blindly trusted that because it was reading a script that was on that web server that it should execute it because it just blindly trusted it without actually seeing what it actually is. So that's the difference between the two. You know, keep that in the back of your mind and even practice it. This OWASP VM, you can download this thing right off the OWASP website. They don't charge you for it. It's free and it's good for practicing and demonstrating um, various kinds of web application vulnerabilities. There's one more that I'll show on here before we move into SQL injection and that's session manipulation and token manipulation via uh, Burt suite. So uh, I thought I had Burp running already. Maybe I close it, but let's uh, start Burt. All right, so to set up Burp to use the proxy, the first thing is you have to make sure that whatever you have is your options in Burp you match that in your browser that you're going to be doing the test with. So I'm going to need to go in here and in my settings, set the proxy to match what we have uh, in Burp actually, like so. Look back 8080. And then in Burp, we have look back 8080. So what that means is all of my traffic that comes out of my browser and comes into my browser will come through Burp. So it is now the proxy. It's like it's sitting right outside my browser, All right? So the other thing is the intercept. Uh, right now, the intercept is on. So what's going to happen is when I try to re-authenticate or go back this DBWA site, pull it off here. I think I'm just going to use the more recent version of Earth here. Well, now this is the uh, Burp Suite Professional, which you have to pay for, but, um, you know, you don't need the professional to do everything that I'm going to show you here. All right, so we'll make sure our proxy set here. And I'm going to show you Firefox. What's an arbitrary update should it just forced on me there? Seems like every other day Firefox changes how you get to the proxy settings. All right, so there we go. All right. So let's go look at EBWA from here. All right, so see what's happening. See how I put the URL in it. It's just sitting there spinning. That's because the BERT proxy has captured it, right? So if we go to the intercept, we can see that it's captured that request to go to that page. So I have to forward it on all the way through. And then after I keep forwarding it, I eventually get the page. When I log in,
it's just going to sit there and spin, you know, why? Because again, it's captured it in birth. So in that proxy, I have to go in and forward it, but I can see each part. See the um, cookies there? So all of that stuff are, is things that we're done manipulate or try to manipulate here in just a second. So in this application, as it is, right? And cat. And it looks like it might have changed back. All right, so pretty sure we changed it back to the moon, actually. Five and nope. Okay, so now with the uh, intercept on everything that we do is going to come back. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to plant a script on this site that's locked out. Now the DDWA security is set to high, you know, and that's con that's a client side control that's pushed down by the server. So we're going to look at how we can violate that by coming here and say hello again. And then I try to post, you know, like we did earlier, what if I try to do IMG source equal like you know, fact.com, some website or something. 